Hey, Jason here. Today's video, we're going to go keep going over wide point. Um, this is part seven of this analysis. We're digging, still digging through the annual report. Um, if you want to see the other parts in this video, make sure to check them out there in the description below and you can get those for free. But before we get to that, though, I need to let you know you can get this series as a podcast anywhere in the world for free on all major podcasting platforms. Stitcher, Anchor, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, and more. You can get this part of the I Love Value Messy podcast anywhere in the world for free. And if you like this video here on YouTube and our other videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you're notified every time we release a new video and release new videos all the time. No disclaimer, anything today um, other than a short one. This is for informational purposes only, blah, 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 blah. Um, at this point of the analysis, I'm going to do a quick recap since we're seven videos in now. If you haven't seen, again, watch the other videos below if you want to see them. For those who can't or don't want to, quick recap up to this point. White point looks like a good potential investment still, I'd say. There are some questions we need to ask or that, that we need answers to still. Um, frankly, at this point, again, unless we come up with a major red flag, which we may still, because we still were on page, I think, 57 of the annual report. Um, we may still, if we don't, if things continue going kind of on the track they're going, whether I decide to invest in wide point in the portfolios I manage will come down to um, the valuation. Some of the other stuff we'll get to when we get to that point, if we get to that point. Um, other than that, let's get to it. Okay, make sure. Oh, I'm not. Good thing I tested that. There we go. Okay, so got on both screens. Okay, perfect. So this is where we left off last time. My notes are over here on the right side of the screen. Um, this is where we're at. We're into the footnotes. Frankly, to me, most people hate looking at the footnotes. Um, frankly, most people don't read the footnotes. I love reading the footnotes because this is where you find super important information. You can also find super important to know about red flags in this situation. A lot of people don't like reading footnotes um, because they are oftentimes repetitive, especially here. Again, we've seen all this stuff before, but um, you can also find massive red flags and potentially massive hidden, hidden assets in this section as well. So for those of you who haven't seen the other videos, normally when I do these, uh, when I read these four stocks I'm considering personally investing in, um, I read these word for word. What I'm doing in these videos to save time is I'm just scanning. Um, I'm just scanning them. Frankly, because I don't want to bore you to death. <laughs> okay. We already know all this. Blah, blah, blah. Trusted mobility management. Customers efficiently secure, manage, and analyze the entire life cycle of the mobile communications assets through its federally compliant platform intelligent telecommunications management system. They are a government contractor. Again, if you haven't seen any other videos, this would be something to note. A significant portion of the company's expenses, such as personal personnel and facilities costs are fixed in the short term and may not be easily modified to manage through changes in the company's marketplace that may create pressure on pricing and or cost to deliver its services. Again, we've covered this. Um, but if you're just joining us for this video, that would be something to note. Doo, doo, doo. Okay. This is typically an important one to watch or to read organization. Again, they've talked about this above and other places. This is typically an important one to watch because you, this is where you can tell if they're doing some funny business. Um, typically if they are doing some funny, funny business with things like uh, how they account for revenue, stuff like that. Okay. They did a reverse stock split. I don't think we've talked about this before. So we're going to put this in the things of note section. I remember saying that I'm assuming they did a reverse stock split at some point because their share price went up. But here's an explanation of this, and I'm not sure. Oops, let's actually go back. There we go. Okay, so that'll save me some time from having to situate everything. Company on October 23rd, 2020, the company blah, 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 decreased the number of shares from 110 million to 30 million. All shares restricted stock awards and per share information 
has been retroactively adjusted to reflect the stock split. So again, if you haven't seen the other videos, go back and watch those. But for those who haven't, reverse stock splits, uh, a lot of companies do reverse stock splits if they're tiny companies like this one and they ha their share price goes, um, let's say, under a dollar. On most exchanges like New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, stuff like that, you have to have an above $1 per share um, stock price. If you don't, and it stays that way for, let's say, 30, 45 days, you can be delisted from the stock exchange. Most companies do not want that because most times institutional investors, um, investment funds, mutual funds, um, retirement funds cannot invest in stocks unless they are listed on a major stock exchange. So to avoid this problem, on occasion, smaller companies will do reverse stock splits, lowering the number of stocks stock available from 110 million to 30 million in this case. Um, increased the share price above whatever they wanted to increase it to and um, kept them on the stock exchange. It's not, it doesn't really or it doesn't affect the company's economics, operations, anything. It's more of an accounting maneuver. This is important. If if this had major reclassifications or restatements in here, um, that affected. This said it had no effect. Um, if it had an effect on net income, you'd want to know what was going on there. Okay, these ones, counting standards updates. These are typically not super important. Again, I'm just going to scan them here. Test for goodwill impairment. Okay, the most important line here typically is at the bottom for these kinds of things. Um, the company adopted this guidance prospectively on blah, 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 blah. Adoption of this guidance did not have an, a material effect on its consolidated financial statements. Again, you see that up here as well. There was no material effect on the company's uh, consolidated financial statements upon adoption. If you see something that kind of sounds weird in here, um, you need to figure out what's going on with that accounting standard. These accounting standards are changing all the time, so it's not super important to know every accounting standard because, frankly, I have no idea. If you gave me this number, I wouldn't know what that meant. Um, this uh, FASB issued ASU 2018-07. <laughs> I would have no idea what that meant. Um, but you should things should make sense in here. If they don't, you need to figure out what's going on. If it says there was a material effect on the company's consolidated financial statements. You need to figure out how that affected the company's financial statements. Um, if that happens, and frankly, that's pretty rare when that happens, there will be like a chart in here showing the difference of, let's say, net income, a change in net income, um, how a, an accounting change changed, how they recognize net income, something like that. There would be a chart in here usually. And again, that's pretty rare when you see that. They're still evaluating this one. Uh, when it comes to credit losses. Okay. Foreign currency. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. is just outlining how they separate their company into segments. Actual results could differ from these estimates. They usually do. Okay, straightforward. I'm going to completely skip this. Um, actually, I'm not going to completely skip it. I was why well, I was going to completely skip it because I've seen this thousands, tens of thousands of times. Um, what 
what they're talking about here in this entire section is investments and how they are kind of identified for accounting purposes. Um, level one have their things like stocks and you can um, see their prices pretty actively. Level two, um, things like real estate would probably be in here. Um, they have quoted prices, but they can vary. And then level three, they don't have prices that you can find pretty much anywhere. And then it goes into categorizing or usually goes into categorizing. Um, I don't see a chart here, which is kind of weird. Um, there's usually a chart here <laughs> of how they categorize some of their assets and stuff like that. Um, but maybe they don't have any of these. It's usually investments when it comes down to that. So that's probably what I don't have there. Okay. If you do not see here, again, cat, the, we're down to the stage where things should be pretty much, again, word for word, very similar to what you see in other financial statements. If they aren't, you need to figure out why. Typically, cash is three months or less. So if you see something like three years, that's a big problem. Um, that's a big problem here for cash, cash equivalents. It should be three months or less. I've seen 12 months or less as well. If you see three years, anything over a year, that's a massive problem in how they're recognizing their cash. Frankly, I think that one might be illegal <laughs> to do as well. Okay, allowances for doubtful accounts. This is another important one. Um, thing to look for here is that after 90 days, things are considered past due unless arrangements were made with the company. Because they are a government contractor, they typically have longer uh, payables times. Most companies you'll see here are 30, 45, 60 days. Anything past that would be a doubtful account. And if they go, I think it's it depends on the company, but it's usually past 120 or 180 days, then they are written off as a bad debt. Again, if they have something like 365 days and then it's written off after like two years, that's a massive accounting problem. I can't say I've actually ever seen that, but <laughs> that is something to watch out for if you do see it. Okay, this is important. Inventories. Inventories are valued at the lower of cost using first in, first out method or market. Um, if you see last in, first out or LIFO here, you need to figure out why and does that make sense? Uh, most of the time you don't see LIFO anymore. Actually, I know I've seen it, but I can't remember the last time I, I saw it to give you an example. But usually you see first in, first out here. Um, if they are using LIFO, as the inventory, how they uh, how they account for inventory, you need to discount when you do the valuation of the inventory further. Um, why? Because that means they've probably had some inventory for a very long time and they can't sell it if they're doing that. Uh, it's not necessarily a red flag, not necessarily anything illegal. Um, it just means you need to discount the inventory further to make sure you have enough margin of safety. There were no inventory write downs. Good. Property equipment are stated at historical cost. You should pretty much always see that. Net of accumulated depreciation and amortization. If you do not see that. If you don't see, and I, I've seen this only once that I can think of off the top, off the top of my head, where they were stated at, um, they weren't stated at historical cost. What was it? It was like updated market value or something like that. And that is against um, accounting rules. I don't know if it's illegal, but that is not how it should be accounted for. So if you see that, again, I've seen it once maybe, um, that is a problem. They should always be at historical cost based on currently accepted accounting rules. If this changes, then that changes, but that's what it should always be at. These estimated useful lives are important. Uh, typically, if you see something like vehicles in here, it'll have like five years or 10 years max. If you see vehicles, for example, have 20 years, that's a problem. If you see manufacturing equipment that normally has three to five, maybe 10 years tops um, in useful life, and it's being amortized or depreciated at 30 years, that's a problem because it affects how much, um, how slowly or how fast the company is uh, 
depreciating their property and equipment, and that can affect um, income, cash flows, and frankly, the legality of what the company is doing as well. Okay, straightforward there in terms of leases, goodwill and tangible assets. You want to th see how they um, account for things like like um, impairments and write downs here. And I'm reading this word for word. So bear with me on this one. Okay, that's all pretty straightforward here. No impairment of goodwill and other indefinite lived, lived tangible assets. Revenue is another important one to watch. We'll see if we see any issues here. This is interesting, not necessarily bad. Um, it's not bad, it's just weird. Um, so again, this should pretty much be word for word similar to other companies depend, but this is highly dependent on the industry because of they are in a slightly different industry than most and they're a government contractor. Um, this is a little bit weird, like worded, but again, it's not bad. It's just a different industry and they're a government contractor. Revenue is recognized net of any tax collected from customers which are sub subsequently remitted to governmental authorities. So typically this says something is like along the lines of revenue is recognized when the customer takes possession of said item or service or the service is fulfilled. And um, it says something along those lines typically. In this case, it does not say that. Again, not bad, not red flag, it's just how the industry works. So not what I was expecting here to highlight, but this is interesting. This is a commodity type service and margins are nominal. That's interesting. You pretty much never see that in a financial report. When you see that though, it means the company likely doesn't have huge margins, which we found out from um, their financials. It also typically means the company doesn't have competitive advantages either when they are a commodity type business. Um, Frankly, I can't think I've ever seen that wording or even close to that wording in a financial. It's not bad. It's just interesting more than anything. Okay, service. No weird wording up here in the top section. Again, I'm reading this word for word, so make sure there's not any funny business going on. Okay, so far so good. Let's 
Still good. Okay, so nothing weird in that section. Um, and again, I typically read this entire thing word for word, but I was specifically reading those things because again, if you see something that doesn't make sense or you see something that doesn't kind of up with, line up with most other companies' financial statements here, it's a potential massive red flag. For example, um, in some, some cases I've seen revenue recognized not when the company, not when the client takes possession or gets the service, takes possession of the, um, the item sold or gets the service, I've seen companies that recognize revenue as soon as they are contracted to do something, even if they haven't done any work. Um, typically you shouldn't do that <laughs> um, because contracts can be canceled, um, things can change, like we saw with COVID last year. Um, so if you see something that doesn't make sense or it doesn't line up with other financials you've read, then that's a problem. But I didn't see anything issues there. The company's products are generally sold with a right of return. That's, again, common sense to me. But if you didn't know that, um, that's something to, uh, to note. This is a good thing, though. Historically, the returns have been immaterial and recognized in the period in which they were products of return. If they had a high amount of returns, that is an issue. This is interesting. Contract for in the contract balances section, timing of revenue recognition may differ differ materially from the timing of invoicing to customers due to a long-standing practice of issuing a consolidated managed service invoice. Consolidated invoice usually requires data such as billable hours, units. As a result, as a result, it could take between 30 to 60 days after all performance obligations have been met to deliver a complete customer invoice. So that pushes out their cash and revenue cycle. That means they could be in a cash crunch at some point if they're waiting for com companies, uh, their clients to pay them. Again, this isn't a red flag. It's not necessarily a good thing, bad thing. It just is something to note um, in the notes section over here so that you're aware of that. Payment terms, typically 30 to 90 days. That's pretty standard. Government accounts receivable payments could be delayed due to administrative processing delays by the government agency. Again, that is common knowledge to me, as I said in prior videos, because of my dad working in the Air Force. I've been around, not necessarily involved in these negotiations with these contracts. Um, but I have been around these for most of my life. So that is kind of common sense to me that <laughs> government bureaucracy is a real thing and that can lead to delays. Okay, more information on account doubtful accounts, customer accounts, receivable balances that remain uncollected for more than 45 days are re reviewed for collectability and are considered past due after 90 days. Okay, again, that's a little bit longer than normal, but it's not a huge thing. Okay, here we get some more information. Customer accounts receivable balances that remain uncollected for more than 120 days and or that have not been settled in accordance with contractual payment terms and for which no payment commitments exist are placed with a third party collection agency. So they go into collections after 120 days unless they can come to some kind of agreement with the company and a reserve is established for the entire uncollected balance. What does that mean? That's important. And a reserve is established for the entire uncollected balance. So let's say the contract is for $200,000. Somebody doesn't pay for 120 days. That means that $200,000 in estimated revenue goes into a reserve. Um, when that happens, 
if the company's collection agency still cannot get paid after 180 days down here, it writes off, again, in this example, $200,000. So essentially it means that the company lost $200,000 in revenue. This can be a major problem for companies, obviously. Um, in government contract work, I would not expect this to be a massive issue because frankly, if you don't pay your bills as a government contractor, you get banned from being a government contractor. So I would not expect this to be a major issue other than for things like bureaucracy delays and stuff like that. development costs they had a huge increase in development costs last year um, i'm assuming that's likely due to the increase in work from the census uh, because it was nine hundred three thousand dollars last year compared to one hundred forty six thousand dollars in 2019. okay talking about taxes the weirdness there This is interesting. Basic and diluted earnings per share, EPS in parentheses, basic EPS includes no dilution and is computed by dividing net income by the weighted average number of common shares outstanding for the period. Diluted EPS includes the potential dilution that could occur if securities or other contracts to issue comments and restricted stock or exercise or convert it into common and restricted stock. Okay, so it's not as weird as I first thought. I thought it was just gonna end there. So this is not weird. This is normal. Basic EPS includes not all shares, only the shares that are currently outstanding. Diluted EPS includes the shares that could be issued, restricted stock, warrants, uh, common stock that could be options, stuff like that, that could be converted. Um, and that is the number you should always use when, when valuing a company, diluted uh, earnings per share, which we'll talk more about when we get to that. Okay, stock option has a vesting range from three to 10 years. It's pretty common in this arena. Okay. going over accounts receivable here and doubtful accounts there are only 114,000 out of about 35 million last year so that's not a big deal at all goes into more detail about the government contracts typically don't they don't exceed five years commercial contracts typically have two to, are two to three years in length Again, I'm not gonna put this in the notes because I know this kind of stuff. If you didn't, I would put this in the notes. Okay, so this is interesting. It gets into some of their customers. Last year, they had huge receivables from the Census Bureau, um, which we've talked about at length. They also work with NASA, which is cool. That's awesome. Um, space stuff. They don't do space stuff. They probably do some of the uh, behind the scenes stuff for them, but that's cool. They also work with U.S. Immigration and Customs, uh, Border Patrol, and the Census Bureau in the last couple of years as well. And these are only the customers representing 10% or more of the consolidated revenue. Bill accounts receivable. Okay, so these are 
these are monies they have coming in, but that didn't fit into the period. And here are more of those. They also work with the Homeland Security and the Coast Guard as well. So they work with a ton of different government agencies. And again, normally I would put all of this in here, but we kind of already covered this. I think if memory serves me right, we've already covered their customer base. So most of their assets are in, or most of their, not assets, most of their property and equipment is in computer hardware and software. Not surprising as a computer software company. Okay, this is an important section, leases. Six to nine year terms on the leases with an additional five year extension available. Payment escalations of three to four percent per year. Again, that's pretty typical stuff. Early termination provisions that require them to pay fees. Again, common stuff. The earliest they could terminate a lease or that the landlord could terminate a lease if they wanted to would be 2023. So that puts them in place for at least another two-ish years. And where is the full amount? It's usually got more information on that, but maybe that's what they pay. So their operating lease expenses went down in 2020. I'm assuming that's because of the COVID stuff. A lot of landlords gave breaks to people in the COVID stuff or during the uh, initial COVID lockdowns because they couldn't pay their bills. So okay, this is interesting. Uh, they have 11 point four years remaining on their operating leases. That's good. Typically you want the leases to last longer because that creates stability for the company. Finance leases, I would need to know more about what these are, um, but that's not necessarily a huge deal. I look at operating leases more than finance leases. This is the important number that I was looking for, 832,000. So you would need this to calculate total enterprise value for a company. Um, we're not going to do that now. I might do that at some point, but this is this is an important number to know for that calculation. This amendment last year. straightforward stuff up above here it goes into more detail about their intangible assets customer relationship makes up about two million dollars of their intangible assets uh, channel relationships is about 2.7 million dollars internally developed software about 1.9 million dollars and trade name and trademarks is about uh, just under three hundred thousand dollars most of that which has been amortized off the balance sheet and only remaining is about 2.2 billion dollars or 2.2 million dollars uh, in book value Okay, and then again, you just get a ton of detail down here. Um, there are purchase intangibles, internally developed intangibles. You get a ton more detail down here about what goes into this stuff. Um, yeah, software development. Amortization schedule. No changes in goodwill last year. This breaks down the cost by the segment of business. OK, 
carrier service costs was 11.8 million uh, of that. Oh no, that's uh, added. So salaries and payroll taxes on top of that, 2.8 million, and then blah, 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 blah. This gives more um, information on line of credit, which we talked about, I believe, in the last video, maybe the video before. Income taxes. Again, we already talked about the net operating lease carry forward. Um, that was enormous for the company last year. <laughs> to say the least, that helped them go from, um, actually helped them get a huge amount of money back because they were unprofitable in prior years. They were profitable last year so they could recognize a huge amount of money and get that as a benefit last year. This goes into detail on that. Okay, here's the net operating loss carry forwards they still have as of 2020, end of 2020, minus the valuation allowances. And we should get some more detail down here about the net operating loss carry forwards. And again, if I remember right, we already covered these, $36.1 million net operating loss carry forwards for federal. They also have 36 million in state income taxes. So their entire market cap as of this recording or as of the earlier recording was about 50 million. So they have about $72 million in state and federal net operating loss carry forwards to use to offset future gains. And essentially what that means in the real world sense is they may not have to pay taxes for a decade if they can remain profitable. Um, and this could double the value of their company if they use the capital well from this. Okay. Preferred stock, they can issue up to 10 million shares in preferred stock without getting shareholder approval based on their bylaws. It's pretty standard. That companies can do that. Most companies do not have, uh, do not have preferred stock anymore though. Going into detail on stock issuances to employees. They did repurchase some shares in 2019 and they still can repurchase 2.1 million shares going forward. Um, they can issue shares up to $24 million in shares. That would be bad for a tiny company to issue that many shares. Again, I don't know what their market cap is today, but that the beginning of this analysis is around $50 million. So that would dilute shareholders by about 50% if they diluted or if they sold all those shares at the market. That would be bad for reasons we've talked about in other videos. That's how they go about valuing the stock awards. Nothing super important here. Again, super detailed, nothing super important here either though. So they have about 134,000 shares remaining under their outstanding and exercisable share awards as of the end of 2020. And the average share price is $5.37 per share. I don't know what the share price is right now. Frankly, I keep it that way. You probably keep wondering why I don't look at the market cap and the share price. I don't want to. Uh, when we get to the valuation, I don't want to know what the share price is. I don't want to, want to know what the market cap is. I want to purposely forget that. Um, so that when I do value the company, I'm not biased either negatively or positively. How could I do that? If I'm, if I know what the share price is and I want to buy this stock, for example, I could purposely make the valuation higher so I can buy underneath that. Um, again, I don't want to do that. So I don't even remember what the share price is. I don't know what the market cap is as of today either. Let's 
stock-based compensation, tons of stock-based compensation. Oh, right. That's, I thought that was a shares, $810,000 worth. That's not a huge amount. Of it. I thought it was 810,000 shares. Okay. So here's a full illustration of the net operating loss carried forward last year. Without that it was about $7.5 million. They would have had a profit of about two and a half million dollars, which frankly would have been great. Um, far higher than last year, but with that net operating loss carried forward, they had a net profit of $10.3 million, which is spectacular compared to their previous numbers. Not important. Revenue is broken down by the business segment. Uh, carry services makes up the bulk. Managed services make up the other amount. Federal government, U.S. federal government makes up the huge majority of revenue. North America makes up the huge majority of revenue. Okay, not important. And now we're going to get to legal name and subsidiaries and stuff. So we are done with the 10K. Oh, no, we're not done yet. I spoke too soon. So <laughs> these are um, new-ish. I think these got added after the financial crisis, 2007-2008 timeframe. Essentially, the people running the company, CEO, I think CFO, have to certify that they are good with these financials and they make sense. Um, yeah, there's another one. Blah, 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 and they just have to do that. Or they can't release the annual statements. So we are done with the annual statements. And... That was for another video. Let me bring back over here to my face. There we go. Okay. So at this point, NVIDIA still looks like an okay-ish potential stock to buy. Um, has some profitability issues. Has an issue with a major potential issue in terms of how to affect the valuation with the loss in census revenue that we talked about. I think that was video three or four. Um, as of this point, Point, we're going to actually value the stock uh, multiple ways though to see what the stock's valuation is because frankly at this point it's an okay-ish investment if it's massively undervalued this may be a stock to invest in if it's fairly valued overvalued it's not there's not enough margin of safety we'll figure that on, out in the next video on one point though um usually at this stage i don't go straight to the valuation i read the quarterly reports actually no we'll, we'll do the quarterly report next time um, and the proxy report, we probably won't, won't do the proxy report. We might just scan that. We'll do the quarterly report for sure next time instead of the valuation. Um, may do the proxy report after that, and then after that's the valuation. Um, the reason I was going to skip over that was to kind of show you what the valuations were, but um, we can't skip the quarterly because especially since the annual came out, that was March, April timeframe usually. Um, as, as of this recording in mid-October, that's a long time ago. So we need to find out more up-to-date information on the company before we do the valuation. So if you like this video or if you watch this video and you like it, make sure to like, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. If you do subscribe on YouTube, make sure to hit the notification bell so because or so you're notified because we're releasing new videos all the time. If you listen on the podcast, again, thanks so much. Really appreciate that as well. On the podcast, make sure to also, uh, all that same stuff we just talked about on YouTube, but make sure to leave a review because the more reviews, views, and listens we get on our podcast, the more people we can help. If you want to learn how to evaluate stocks better and faster, make sure to check out the free resources below, which I'm not going to get into today, um, but those links are below. You can get our five free gifts. You can get um, our seven tips to picking great stocks and three times you must sell. And you can also get a free PDF copy of my book, How to Value Invest. The reason I'm not getting into those today is because at this stage of the analysis, reading financial statements, you really need help from our Value Investing Masterclass, which um, is open. We're doing live group trainings again. We just did our first one uh, of the new sessions last week. And in this course, you'll learn everything you need to know to find, evaluate, and value great stocks fast. And that includes a huge part of the course is how to read financial statements, what we just went through um, here. So make sure to join if you want to value, evaluate, find, and read financial statements better on potential investments, make sure to join our Value Investing Masterclass. In this masterclass, you also not only get access to all this stuff and video resources and quizzes, 
You'll also get access to live group trainings and live one-on-one -on -one sessions. If you're among the first, um, you'll get the live group trainings no matter what. You get the free one-on-one -on -one training sessions if you're among the first 10 people to buy. You also get a free uh, value investing blueprint, which shows you the exact process step-by-step -step that I take anytime I evaluate stocks. You get that for free as well um, for the first 10 people that sign up. But until next time, um, if you want, oh, sorry, I skipped that. If you want more information on our masterclass, and again, really want you in there. Really would love to have you. Uh, the more students we have in here, the better, um, because the more questions get asked, the more people learn faster. And I want to, I would love to help you reach your goals in whatever it is in terms of investing. And I can do that in the masterclass. And you can find out more information on that below. But until next time, have a great day. Talk soon.